All right, it's good to see everybody here this evening, and certainly look forward to our time of worship together. Let's take our hymn books and turn to 110. Hymn number 110. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. The drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. Him of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take our Bibles and for our scripture reading and commentary, look to Philippians chapter 4. This is a great epistle that Paul wrote to the Philippians and a great chapter to remind us of God's blessings upon us in all ways and all things, every reason us to be content, knowing that all blessings flow through the Lord Jesus Christ to his people. So he says here in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brethren, dear, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. This is an amazing scripture that is written for the encouragement of these that the Lord had given such a tenderness to Paul because of how the Lord had drawn them to Christ through the preaching of the gospel and through much persecution and tribulation. You can go over and read in the book of Acts chapter 16 and read how the Lord established this congregation there in Philippi and now Paul, in prison, when he wrote this, suffering for the gospel's sake, delighted to hear that these for whom he had preached continue to stand fast in the Lord. And he encourages them to continue to do so. When he says, my brethren dearly beloved, he repeats it twice in the same verse. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. They're dearly beloved because of the same work of the Lord Jesus Christ on their behalf, called to the same gospel, the same Christ, the same righteousness in which all that are the Lord's stand, but dearly beloved also in the Lord. As he said, stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Those that are the Lord's are dearly beloved of God. And that love flows through each one that 
God has chosen, and Christ has redeemed, and the Spirit is called. And so his concern here is for two that appear not to be getting along. I love how scripture, when you read it, eventually it's going to come across every situation. Here he says, I beseech Euodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. We know as families, you can have conflicts, but you never separate because you're family. And we know as sinners that we're going to have conflict with others that are in the body of Christ. And yet, we're not to resolve those as the world would attempt to resolve them or even separate over these conflicts, but rather consider, as he says here, who these are in the Lord, that they may be of the same mind in the Lord. We might find reason to find fault over many things with those with whom we worship. And even more so, they find fault with us. And yet none of that is supposed to affect us to such a point where we're, we separate. Rather, be of the same mind in the Lord. Consider God's unconditional love on behalf of each of his own and to deal with each other in that same unconditional love. God has not imputed our sin to us, but the Lord Jesus Christ has borne it. So why should we then impute the sin of another that is the Lord's to them. Now, these are matters that being of the same mind in the Lord is to consider who we are as forgiven sinners, not perfect other than in Christ's righteousness, but forgiven and loved just the same, knowing that we're no better than anyone else. So he says, I treat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. How could Paul make such a bold statement of any to say, well, their names are in the book of life? Well, all we can do is judge based upon man's confession and where the Lord has been pleased to do a work of grace in the heart, they're going to rejoice in the Lord and they're going to love their fellow brethren in the Lord. And that is all the work of God's grace. It certainly isn't natural to any, any of us, but where we see in someone, this grace, where we see it manifested, where we see them looking to the Lord in every case for themselves, there's some hope then that their names are in the book of life. In other words, elect of God, chosen of the Father, and ones for whom Christ came in this world. Now, we can be deceived ourselves and we can be deceived by others. We know that there are some that outwardly appear to be the Lord's and to be walking with him that suddenly go away. It's not that they were the Lord's and now they're no longer the Lord's, but they never were the Lord's. If they go away, they never were the Lord's. But those whose names are in the book of life, notice any that are the Lord's, it's not by any effort of themselves, but it's God's grace that has chosen them and called them and <coughs> keeps each one of his own. It says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Not just in comfortable times, but rejoice in the Lord always, in every manner, knowing that even in the difficult times, it's the Lord that is bringing us through these particular trials. And it's the same Lord, whether it's in times of comfort or whether it's in times of distress but in all things rejoice. That doesn't mean to be giddy. You've heard these preachers get up and say, everybody put on a smile, be happy. And uh, as if that is what it is to rejoice in the Lord. To rejoice means to give him all the glory in all things, that 
whether we're comfortable or not, whether we feel at peace in whatever situation we're in, that we're giving him the glory. To rejoice in the Lord is to give him the glory in all things. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It says moderation, but we're not cast about by every wind that comes our way, but to be in moderation, that it be known unto all men, that, that those that see us in that time of trial, our prayer is that God's grace keep us and sustain us so that we're not acting or reacting in a way that discredits the Lord in any way. When it says the Lord is at hand, that could mean that his coming is at hand, but also it is that even in every situation, you're the peace, keeping steady on, if you will, by the Lord's mercies, the Lord is at hand. In other words, he's directing. That's why the psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. The Lord is at hand. I, I know that as the Lord enables me to, in whatever the situation, that to look to him and to see that even in that situation, he is at hand. He's directing it. That will keep this heart from complaining. It would keep this heart from fear and trouble. Because the Lord is at hand. That's why it says in verse 6, be careful for nothing. Be careful means to worry. I know he's saying things that are contrary to our nature, not to fear. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, but notice, with thanksgiving. I think we think we pray a lot more than we do. Most of our prayers are just fleshly words addressed toward God, but as the Spirit directs us to pray and that to supplicate is what you do in a time of need where you have nothing, but always with thanksgiving, knowing that the Lord is going to answer exactly as He's purposed. Let your request be made known unto God. Most people, what they call prayer is trying to twist God's will and bring Him into conformity to theirs, which is just this rebellion. I like that illustration that I read one time. It's like a ship pulling into the wharf and they throw out the rope and pull on the rope. The wharf isn't moving toward the ship. The ship is being drawn to the wharf and that wharf is representative of God. Prayer like that rope that you throw out there and, and seek the Lord with, with prayer and supplication. But it's the ship that moves in to the wharf. Through prayer, the Lord is drawing us into submission to His will, not the opposite. And so that's how we're to address God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's that peace with God that Christ worked out there at Calvary, whereby by His death, his children have been reconciled to him, but there's that peace of God as well. That's the heart peace. That's that rest. That this same God who worked out our salvation is the same God who continues to work in us by his spirit, that peace. And it passes all understanding. I've had some say to me in dire times, I don't understand why I'm so calm. Well, that's the Lord. Because otherwise we'd be fretting just like anybody else. That's his mercy. It, it passes all understanding. And it is he that keeps our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's not us holding on to Christ. It's him holding on to us. It's the shepherd holding the sheep and drawing that sheep to himself in his bosom. So finally, brethren, verse 8, whatsoever things are true, we want some things that Scriptures instruct us to consider whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, 
whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. But when you go through that list, don't you see the very character and attributes of our Lord Jesus Christ and every one of them? What sort of things are true in him? Because in, in the verse 7 it says, through Christ Jesus. What sort of things are honest in him? He cannot deceive. He will not mislead. What sort of things are just in him? What sort of things are pure in him? There's no justice. There's no purity apart from who Christ is and that work put to our account. What sort of things are lovely? There's nothing lovely in us, but it's all in him, altogether lovely. What sort of things are of good report? There's none of us that has a good report, but in Christ, think about those things in him that are of a good report. Everything that this word has to say about who he is. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. These aren't in us. Think upon who he is. Think upon what he has accomplished in order that we might be blessed in him. And those things he says in verse 9, which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. He's not pointing them to himself, but he's saying, I know whereof I speak unto you because I know how God has been pleased to deal with me as a sinner. What sort of things ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. In other words, the same thing I'm telling you of, consider how the Lord has been merciful to me, the sinner. And therefore, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Here again, he comes back to this bond that there is between those that are the Lord's, that their desire is to be able to use what they have to help and encourage one another, especially here, Paul. They said he lacked opportunity in the sense, it's not like today where you can go down to Western Union send some money over to somebody and within a, a short amount of time they've got it. Here he was in Rome in prison. There they were at Philippi, great distance. And he said he'd heard and learned that their desire was to care for him even while he was in prison. It's not like our modern day prisons here where you get three square meals a day taken care of and got a bed now these were the prisons that if somebody didn't provide you food or drink, then you, you died. You suffered hunger. And so they were concerned for him as one of the Lord's servants. And so he tells them, he's thankful for that, but he says, not that I speak in respect of want. He said, I'm not in any way complaining or saying that I lack in any way, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Again, is that grace of God, that peace that passes all understanding, that irrespective of whether today I've got three meals or I have to go without a meal, that whatever state I am, therewith to be condemned, whether I'm in bonds or whether I'm free. Oh, that the Lord would grant us such a peace. He said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. It takes grace when the Lord brings you low, but also it takes grace when he abundantly blesses you because our flesh will take credit for it. Our flesh will begin thinking now, all right, now things are turning around. That's good. That's why he said, I, I know both how to be a base and how I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed. Here again, what's a disciple? It's one who learns at Christ's feet. There's a continual learning that goes on. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Contrary to what we hear preached in popular religion, that if you're really walking close to the Lord, then you're, you're just going to be constantly going upward. That's not how God's purpose is. He's purposed that 
even his children, at times suffer hunger, but not to the point of despair. And to abound. When that abounding comes, it's not based on luck. It's not based on hard work. It's based on the Lord being pleased to, to bless. And so he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Here's one of those verses that everybody likes to quote. I, I can do all things. And they put the emphasis on I. I just have to stay, stay close to the Lord. That's the way they reason. Now here it's speaking with regard to being the Lord's servant and doing all that Christ as purpose should be done. Otherwise, nothing could be done. And that all he puts in our hand to do is by his strengthening. It takes his strength and even to look to him in each moment. And uh, to rest in him, whatever it is, it's the Lord doing the strengthening. Else we couldn't believe. Else we couldn't desire to please him. It's the Lord that gives all things. Notwithstanding, he says, you have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. So it goes back to thanking them again for whatever gift it was that they brought him for that time. It was time. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Again, it shows that the Lord purposed that he looked to him alone the Lord alone for his sustenance, not to men. Not like some going around from place to place and soliciting money through love gifts or whatever in order to carry on their so-called ministries. No, Paul was completely shut up. He says there wasn't any other church that communicated with him. And it, he's not blaming them for that, but he's saying these other congregations were of meager means. And would not have been able to support him or communicate with him. But that's not a grievance for him. Even in that, he thanks the Lord. He says, for even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. If the Lord be pleased to use any one of us as an instrument to encourage any other in the Lord that the fruit of that be to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ he says that's my greatest joy but I have all and abound I'm full having received of Epaphroditus so this was one of their leaders that came over to Rome all that distance and we're talking about pretty poor travel conditions and yet came all that way in order to see Paul and be able to then carry the word back to the Philippians that all was well with him. So he's thankful for this one that brought the gift from the Philippians. And he says, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. It's not that works like this or well pleased, but the fact that this was done for Christ's sake, knowing that what Christ had done in his sacrifice, whereby we're made accepted in the beloved. And so he's thankful that even as he received that gift, it's, it's as if it were Christ himself. And he's thankful. But my God, verse 19, here's another verse that everybody likes to quote. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Who does the supply? It's God. Why does he do the supply? Well, it's not for anything in us, but according to the, his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's the one that does the supply in his time, in his way. And so he concludes, now unto God and our Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Everything that is done to the glory of God. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. That word saint means justified ones. Again, in every sentence, he's reminding them of why we are what we are. It's by the grace of God. It's through the work of Christ. And 
that justifying grace that he accomplished there at the cross. The brethren which are with me greet you. Even though Paul was in prison, he gave Paul fellowship with different ones that came to meet him there in Rome. All the saints salute you. And this is an interesting statement right here. Chiefly they that are Caesar's household. If for no other reason, God took Paul to Rome as a prisoner. And he acknowledged it was it was he was Christ's prisoner, not, not man's. Yet through that we see that the Lord had, even in Caesar's household, whether servants, we don't know to what level, but there were those that were God's elect. And God purposed that through this means they should hear of Christ, even though he was in prison. And so he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's what it's all about. It's the grace of God through Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious Father, thank you for this comforting word. I pray that you would bring it home to our hearts and uh, cause us, dear Lord God, not to look to our circumstances or any personal needs that we think we have, but to look to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ alone, and to be thankful in all times and all ways for his great work accomplished on our behalf. Oh, what blessings flow from you through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to such wretches as we are, and yet by your grace considered to be saints through the work of Christ and how you're a just God and Savior in his work and what he's accomplished. And so we commend this hour to you and pray for your blessing even as we continue to worship his eyes to see Christ and Christ alone. I give you thanks and praise in his precious name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 193. 193. No, not despairingly come I to thee. No, not despairingly Come I to thee, no, not distrustingly, bend I the knee. Sin hath gone over me, yet is this still my plea, Jesus hath died. Of mine iniquity, crimson have been, infinite, infinite, sin upon sin, sin of not loving thee, sin of Trusting thee, infinite sin. Lord, I confess to thee sadly my sin. All I am tell I thee, all I have been. Purge thou my sin away, wash thou my soul this day, Lord, make me clean. Faithful and just art thou, forgiving all, loving and kind art thou. When poor ones call, <coughs> Lord, let the cleansing blood, blood of the Lamb of God, pass o'er my soul. Then all is peace and light, this soul within. 
Thus shall I walk with thee, the loved unseen. Leaning on thee, my God, guided along the road, nothing between. <laughs> Let's take our Bibles and look together in 2 Kings chapter 7. And I've entitled this message, Windows in Heaven. Scriptures speak of heaven being opened. And from heaven, God exercising his will and purpose. And here we have a story of this. God was pleased to open the windows in heaven by way of blessing. Remember last time the Lord had brought a siege on Samaria. And so grievous was the siege, as we saw last time, that the woman called out to the king when he was walking by the wall, complaining that she had negotiated with another woman that today they would eat her son. That's how despicable the situation was and that the next time they would eat her son. And so she killed her son and gave the flesh for them to eat just to survive. And when it came time now to give her son, all of a sudden she hid her son, as we saw in verse 29. And I know when you read this, you think, well, how deplorable can God in any way ordain that such an event should take place? Well, we have too high an opinion of ourselves. That's the number one problem. We think that we deserve better than death. And we have too low an opinion of God when we consider that he does what he does according to his will, and he's just in doing so, and that he's holy. We talk about God's holiness, but we have no clue what that means. We look even at this and think, well, how holy God is. But if you really want to see an example of just how holy God is, look at what he did to his son. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up, that he might freely give salvation unto that people for whom Christ paid the debt. Consider that. We talk about these women not sparing their own sons. But that was deserved. That, this is a punishment deserved. This city had been for years in idolatry. This was in Samaria. This is where they raised up the worship of the golden calf and everybody going along like everything's fine. And so when the Lord brings his judgment to bear, suddenly now you hear people crying out. Think how the Lord spared not his own son, but that wrath that was due unto those that he purposed to save fell on his son. So we looked at that last time, even verse 33, when people were talking about this, one of the messengers that came unto Elisha, and you can see him there, we saw that in verse 32, he's sitting in his house. All of these things going on, but he was resting in even this being God's purpose. And so when they came and saw him, he said, Behold, this messenger said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? And so taking matters into their own hands, well, if this is of the Lord, then we're not just going to sit here and take this. So this particular messenger, even in how he acted and spoke to Elisha, it's pretty clear that this was one of the king's messengers, and it was his complaint against the Lord. Rather than seeing the sin as his and the, and the people's, he, he blames the Lord. That's what people do today. And so, verse 1, Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. You want to know something about the Lord? Well, hear this. Thus saith the Lord. 
this is what is so vital for us whenever people confront us over who God is and how he's fulfilling his purpose in the world, finding fault with him. Well, look, thus saith the Lord. This past week, I had a man walking by church buildings I was pulling in, and I greeted him. He didn't respond. He, he looked like he was focused on something else, but as I was getting out of the vehicle, he comes around, and he calls out to me. He said, you the reverend? And I said, no, there's only one reverend. I'm just his servant. The reverend is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he said, well, I've got a question for you. And he said, you could tell he was angry, but he was about to get a lot angrier by the time I finished answering him because he said, what kind of God would write all these rules and regulations down in a book they call the Bible? and then require you to do these things and that he loves you and yet in the end he sends up, ends up sending you to hell anyway. What kind of God is that? And uh, as I began to speak to him, I said, well, God is God, number one. And uh, number two, I can tell you that there's none in hell that God loves. And this is where he started getting even more angry than the false God that he'd been preached. I said, God is the one who determines who he'll save and who he'll condemn. And if he has not paid your sin debt through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, hell is your just desert. But there's none in hell that he loves. Everybody he loves, all those sinners he set his love upon from eternity in Christ, he's saved in him. Well, that, that doesn't sound fair to me. Well, it doesn't matter if it's fair or not. And I mention that because in this story, here's this messenger that came down to him and he's angry. Behold, this evil is of the Lord. He's not saying it as we would look at it by God's grace and say all things are from his hand and bow to it. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? In other words, what good is it to trust in that, that God? And so here's where Elisha responds according to the word of the Lord. This gentleman, the more I pointed him to the word, the more he pushed back. He said, oh, that's just men's ideas and men's thoughts. Well, I finally had to tell him, well, then have at it. What are you angry about? If, if, if God is not who he says he is, then get on your way. But here, Elisha answers and said, thus saith the Lord. Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. So here's God's promise through Elisha that within 24 hours, the entire economic situation in Samaria would be completely reversed. We talked today about trends in economy. But here's an act of God that he had brought this nation to its knees because of their idolatry. And yet in a 24 hour period, everything would be turned around. Instead of scarcity in the city, now there would be such abundance that food prices would radically drop in the city. People go back and try to figure out what, what would a fine a measure of fine flour be for a shekel. A shekel was like a uh, like we have a, like a penny, and now you're going to be able to in a day be able to get the barley and the fine flour for a penny. It's going to be sold. It's going to be so abundant. Economic times will be abundant, and so the gate was the marketplace where now these people would bring their wares and begin to, to uh, sell, and buy and sell once again. Then verse two, it says, a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God. So this tells you who this man was. When it says that upon whom the king leaned, this was one of his key counselors, the king that had come this way, and yet an unbeliever. And uh, he was 
speaking with Elisha here out of that unbelief. But this Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, and this is where the unbelief manifests itself, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, that's where we get the title, windows in heaven, might this thing be? So what, what is unbelief? This is a thing that we look at here. Well, first he was doubting the power of God. Because the little G-O-D that most people worship today depends on man to do something. And here, Elisha is just clearly telling, no, this is the Lord's work. Is God not able in a 24-hour period to completely turn a situation around to his honor and glory? If God wills it, it'll be done. This is the God that this world doesn't know or understand. They think that he's a little God, little G-O-D, that depends upon our prayers and our doings and our repentance first. There's no mention here of this Samaria repenting first for God to do this. This is God acting according to his will and his kindness even toward undeserving sinners as if he were just dropping the food through this window in heaven down upon them. So when it speaks there of windows in heaven, it is a reminder that all blessings come from the Lord above. That a man can receive nothing is what John the Baptist declared there in John chapter 1, except he receive it from heaven, receive it from the Father. That's true materially, but it's also true spiritually. That none of us could truly know God were not that God is pleased to open the windows of heaven and to pour out on his own those that he has purposed to save for whom Christ died. The Lord Jesus Christ himself came from heaven to this earth and humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So windows here is, is figuratively speaking, but there's no question in reading this that the origin of it is the Lord. We dare not doubt the power of God. We're not just talking about material turnaround, we're talking about spiritual. There's no case too hard for God. Consider your own case, consider mine. Were it not that the Lord had purposed to bless us in Christ and to give us hearts to turn to him. You think about what the heart is. This here is describing a famine, physical famine land. But you think about your own heart in the darkness and rebellion in this heart. And yet it's nothing for God when he's pleased to open the windows of heaven and cause those hearts to be turned to him. But here we have nothing but doubting the power of God. Do as he will, when he will, how he will. But secondly, too, is to doubt the creativity of God. Is God not the God who said in the beginning, let there be light and there was light? He spoke and it was. Here in the mind of this king's officer, the way that food would come to the city was in a way that was not natural because the city was surrounded. It was being besieged. There was an army. And that was why there was such famine at this time. They're only looking around and thinking, how on earth is God going to get the food in here? And it really doesn't explain how. It just says that the next day, within 24 hours, there would be food being sold in the marketplace for a penny, for a shekel. And people enjoying that supply. Well, the clear answer to that is simply that it's coming from God. Here again, we d doubt God's creativity in the sense of him working all things to his honor and glory. That's what happened with the children of Israel as they left Egypt and found themselves with the Red Sea in front, with the mountains on every side. And with the Pharaoh's army bearing down on them. And uh, they feared that Moses had brought them out there now to die. What did Moses say? Stand still 
and see the salvation of the Lord. That's the answer. When we're in situations like this, and we don't know where we're going to see the matter resolved. Well, the same God who's the creator, is he not able to work in such a way in the end that he gets the glory? So they doubted God's power. They, they doubted his creativity. He'd already defeated the Syrian army one time. So what would it be now to defeat the army again here? But thirdly, and most importantly probably, he doubted the messenger of God. Elisha stands as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was God's messenger for that people. And yet, this is a way of mocking even the messenger, like they did with our Lord when he was on this earth. When he spoke, they mocked him, not seeing him as being God's son and come for the deliverance of those that God sent him to save. And so this is why when he says, behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, see, if is doubting even his power to do so. He said, this is Elisha's word to him, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. How many people even in Christ's day saw the Son of God in the flesh and yet never partook of him because they were left to their darkness, their blindness, their unbelief. Well, I'll tell you, if there's anything to be of concern to us, it, it would be that we would ever doubt God's power, that he, we would ever doubt his providence, but that we'd ever doubt the one true testimony that he sent in this world, and that is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And how many people hear of him and in essence see how he set forth in this word and yet will never enter in. That's what happens when God leaves sinners to their own corrupt flesh that they will never believe. There again, it takes the windows of heaven being opened in order to see. A man cannot enter the kingdom of God unless God gives him eyes to see and causes them to be born again. That's an interesting word even there, born again, being born from above. If the windows of heaven be open and the Spirit enter into the hearts of those that Christ came to save. But all others, they'll observe. There are people that read this word just like we do, but never will enter in. They'll suffer eternal condemnation left to their blindness. So unbelief has many different facets but it's all against God. It's all against his word. It's all against his Christ. Even where some in unbelief, when they hear the gospel preached in clarity and, and distinction, unbelief says, oh, this sounds like a new thing. It can't be true. When you preach salvation by the grace of God alone and the Lord Jesus Christ through his finished work alone, that's what unbelief will say. This flesh will say, that's impossible. That's too good to be true. Or this, I've never heard this before. And since I've never heard it before, it must not be true. Even unbelief says that a sudden thing cannot be true. Something that the Lord suddenly. But you think about your own conversion if you're the Lord's. It, of a sudden. Here we are reading this scripture all this time. And of a sudden, now our eyes are open. That's the windows of heaven. Or unbelief says there's no way that this can be accomplished by God alone. There's got to be an input from man somewhere. No. Nope. And even if God does something, unbelief says it's not enough. Not enough. So for Elisha here pronouncing this harsh judgment, on the king's doubting officer. He would see the word fulfilled, but not benefit from its fulfillment. Like so many today, they hear this word preached and they see how God is pleased to do his work of grace in others, and yet they remain isolated in darkness. We're gonna sing that hymn to close our 
meeting the little bits. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And so here we see then who it is the Lord is pleased to bless. It, it's not the high and the mighty. This messenger that was the king's close counselor, the one on whose arm the king leaned for counsel, yet the Lord passing him by in this. And here we see now an instance of poor lepers, verse 3, and there were four lepers, leprous men, at the entering in of the gate. And they said to one another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. They're expressing and acknowledging their complete despair of any situation left to ourselves. We will die. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. See, they had not heard this word that Elisha had directed to the king's messenger. So they're out here. And this is a good representation in these lepers of who we are, objects of God's favor, yet not knowing it, considering ourselves to be condemned like the rest. And being utterly cast upon his mercy. They're saying, let us fall in the under the host of the Syrians, and if they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. And so they rose up in the twilight. See, this is before the Lord had caused those windows of heaven to be opened and pour forth his blessing. They rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians, and when they were come to the uttermost part, of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. This again it shows how God was pleased to work without even an arrow shot being fired or a stone slump. There was no man there. When the Lord's pleased to work, that's what he does is get man out of the way. And there's none that could take unto themselves the glory of what took place here. Here they were sitting waiting to die. They were on the outskirts of the Syrian camp, but to their surprise, again, this wasn't even their willing it to be so, that God had acted. No, to their surprise, it's what I call being surprised by grace, because it's all the Lord's doing, that there was no man there. This huge army, stop and think about what it would have taken for this army to surround the city of Samaria and put such a siege on it for many months. We're not talking about some small thing here. That this camp was the home and supply center for thousands of men, perhaps hundreds of thousands of men. And when the lepers come upon it in the twilight of the morning, they discover an empty army camp. What? Fully supplied. You say, well, how can these things turn around? They were well off because they were the, the army that was putting siege on Samaria. They had plenty to eat, but no man around. Is not the Lord able to take what he will and use that to fulfill his purpose over here, even though they were abject enemies of God himself? And so that's what we're reading here. While they were on the outskirts of the Syrian army, this implies that they were just coming to the edge of the camp of this army. This is the beginnings of just wondering, well, what is taking place? What is going on? And then they walked around even to the furthermost parts of the Syrian camp, and they were approaching figuring that at some point they might run into somebody. But here the Lord is manifesting to them. 
And notice they give the glory to the Lord in verse 6, not to man. It says, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. This is how the Lord caused this army to flee, hearing the noise as if it was a noise of battle. There again, talk about creativity. Is not the Lord, the God of the universe, able to create such a sound for no other reason than to cause these to flee? Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. Who determines these things? It's the Lord. Left it as it was. But they left it as it was because God had purposed that all of that should be used now for in kindness. As I said, the Lord didn't require repentance first before he did this according to his will and power. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp and they went into one tent and did eat and drink and hadn't eaten for a long time, they're just sitting down thinking, what? And carried that silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. What were they doing here? They were thinking of themselves primarily. Then they said one to another, we do not well. Even that change of heart and of thought, the Lord put it in them because those, those goods that he put there, yes, it was to be for their benefit, but at the same time for all these others. This day is a day of good tidings. That's what the word gospel means. It's not to be hid. If God has been merciful and gracious to lepers such as we are, will we not speak of that goodness and grace to others? We hold our peace. If we tarry till morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now, therefore, come that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied and tents as they were. And he called the porters. They told it to the king's house within. And the king arose in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field. So even there is unbelief. They're setting up an ambush. When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. One of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of Israelites that are consumed, and let us send and see. So even here, they're looking to the arm of the flesh. Let's get organized here. That's what religion does. Let's get organized and let's make sure that this is not a some kind of trap. So they took, therefore, two chariot horses. That's pretty meager, isn't it? That's about all that was left. And the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. I'll tell you, when the Lord brings deliverance, victory complete. I think about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ where Christ himself said he came to defeat every enemy that stood between his people and a holy God. And uh, there was nothing that remained but what God took it out of the way. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel. That's where they got the goods. And two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of the Lord. I love that saying, according to the word of the Lord. So great is his salvation and his provision for 
his own, that all the glory belongs unto him, but it's according to the word of the Lord. How is it that we're brought to trust in such a sovereign God? It's according to his word. That's what we come back over and over again, according to the word of the Lord. But the, the camp left intact. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. See, the king wasn't aware of what Elisha had already told this man. He still puts his confidence in this. And the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. He was trampled to death by people rushing. He died as the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. It came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king. Again, as the Lord has spoken. Where's our confidence even in this matter of salvation and deliverance through the power of God and the Lord Jesus Christ? It's in his word. It came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time at the gate of Samaria. And, the, and that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now, behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be. And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. I see God's distinctive grace. There are those that his purpose should partake of that grace in Christ, from whom all blessings flow. But others will be cut off and left to themselves to die in their unbelief. And that's what verse 20 is about. So it fell out unto him. <coughs> the people trod upon him in the gate. Reminds me of what our Lord said, that the Pharisees would be left out, but those that were sinners, that Christ was drawing, would take the kingdom by violence. It doesn't mean by fighting, but such would be the press to get to Christ, that it was as if they were taking it by storm. And certainly that's how God is pleased to work, drawing sinners unto himself. He gives them that grace to run. They run to him. And uh, no amount of man's unbelief is going to stand in the way. The Lord does it all. All right, let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 235, and then we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. 235. Ask me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at a throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Trusting only in thy merit, would I see thy face? Hear my wounded, broken spirit. Save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art called, do not pass me by. Thou, the spring of all my comfort, 
more than life to me. Whom am I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. All right, everybody have a good evening. Look forward to next time. Oh, it's well.